Hello and welcome to the Student Hub Live. I'm Karen Foley and this is our Exo Mars special. In real time, it is the 21st of October at 12 noon. And for the next two hours, I have a fantastic array of guests who are going to be talking about various aspects of the Exo Mars mission and about space in general and, and planetary sciences. So, for those of you who are new, welcome to the Student Hub Live. You should see some widgets appearing on your screen. This is if you're in the Watch and Engage option. So there are two ways you can engage with us today. Watch and Engage, which is infinitely better because you can chat, you can fill in your responses to the interactive widgets and tell us where you are, how you're feeling right now, um, what subjects you're studying, what level, etc. All of that gives us some really good information to be able to pitch this just at you. And of course, you can ask questions too in the chat or you can email us, studenthub at open.ac.uk, and our Twitter handle is at studenthublive, or the hashtag is studenthublive16. So there are loads and loads of ways to have your questions answered during this session, to tell us what you think, and generally to engage within this academic community, which really is what these Student Hub Live events are all about. So there are lots and lots of different things to do, and to feed in all your chat, I'm joined by Sophie and HJ from our hot desk. Welcome you both. The screen looks brilliant behind you. I see you've got to focus on the weather. Sophie, why is that? Well, I've always wanted to be a weather girl, so we thought we'd take the opportunity today. We're talking about the climate on Mars and things like that. So please tell us what the weather's like where you are, and we'll pop it up on our board. Um, any selfies, anything like that? We have actually had some in already. Yes. Some eager beavers. This is from Eric. So he's actually in Portsmouth. That's his study desk there. This was last week, by the way. This is Friday the 14th, and he's joining us from... Uh, Portsmouth by the Spinnaker Tower. So any selfies, send them through to us, studenthub at open.ac.uk. Um, so yeah, we're all yes. ready and excited. But like, we're just here, so any thoughts you have, anything uh, you want to ask our guests, that's what we're here for. And as Sophie said, we love it when you send us stuff too, and we love to see where you are, uh, what the view looks like from uh, where you are, maybe your study materials that have arrived. But yes, we're very excited and ready to go. Lovely, and someone has a pizza in the oven already. We're just on the jelly beans here today because we've got a lot to get through. But uh, yeah, do have your lunch. Drop in and out as you want to over the next couple of hours or so. You can always watch this on the catch up um, immediately after the show's over. There's a live stream link and so you can catch up on any bits you may have missed. And of course, if you can't be here in real time, that's a great option also. OK, so we thought it would be a good idea to sort of generally introduce some of the things that are important to this whole area of study. So I'm joined by my panel of guests. Welcome, everybody, to the studio. So we have um, John Mason, Rian Chapman, Matt Baum, uh, Jan Rack and Liam Steele. And you're all planetary scientists here at the Open University. So a very, very exciting time. But I wanted to just briefly start by looking at some of the things that are really important. And Jan, I wanted to ask first, how important is Mars, you know, in terms of a planet obviously you know right now it's very hot but um but how important is it in terms of planetary science and and generally um an area of scientific investigation i think it's one of the most important uh, planetary bodies in the solar system because mars was once so three billion years ago habitable so that life forms could existed on mars and um, humanity always searching for for life extra terrestrial life and um, this is what we are looking for not directly but we but step by step and this makes Mars very very important for us and also Mars is normally easy to reach it's nearby uh, compared to the Jupiter moons or Saturn moons and um, with um, cameras we can look onto the surface of Mars directly so it's a very good 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 choice to make science on Mars. Yes, and at least we don't have to measure it in light years. <laughs> so yes. that is always good as well, yes. OK, so so very close to us, easy to get to. And, and like recently with all of the ESA and Roscosmos live streaming events that have happened after, of course, the Trace Paths Orbiter has um, landed in orbit, um, we've been seeing some of the delays have, have been very, very short in terms of how quickly we can get data back to Earth. So that must be an advantage also. Yes, of course. I think it's 50 minutes mm. or so. Yeah. And this is a lot better than uh, communicate with satellites in the uh, um, outer solar solar system. So this makes also the work easier for us. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. And you'll, of course, be talking to us a little bit more um, about uh, various aspects to do with the, um, the surface. Yes, so we'll talk about that a bit later. But Rian, I wanted to ask you about some general research on Mars. What, what's happening just broadly? I mean, the OU are clearly involved with a lot of the, the ESA and Roscosmos <coughs> missions, but broadly, what's happening? 
Well, at the moment, there are five orbiters around Mars. There are three that belong to NASA, two that belong to ESA, and one that's the Indian Space Organization. And there are two rovers on the surface. The orbiters are looking at the surface. They're taking images. They're taking measurements of the atmosphere. And the rovers are looking particularly at the chemistry and the mineralogy of the rocks on the surface. So lots going on, lots of different types of data we can access. And, and comparatively, how much is Mars being researched compared to some of the other planets? So much more on Mars, mm. partly because it is a bit easier to reach, it's a bit easier to get there and put things in orbit, mm. although it is quite hard. Only about half of the missions that we've ever sent to Mars have succeeded. Mm. So it, it's still a hard planet to, to explore, even though it's really close to us. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Liam, I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, we've got our lovely model of the Trace Gas Orbiter and Schiaparelli lander here. But um, in terms of uh, ExoMars, this, this specific project, how important is that in terms of the overall research on Mars? Yeah, I mean, one of the main things we go to Mars for is well, the search for life. And to search for life, really, you need evidence of water and methane. Um, and there's been a few missions in the past that have searched for things like that, but you really need them. Like observations in really, really high resolution because they exist in such small quantities. And the trace gas orbiter that's currently in orbit around Mars now, that can detect methane. It's got the best detection of methane that's possible yeah. that we've ever done so far. So it should give us the best signals if we're trying to detect life, which is incredibly useful. But as well as that, there's also the rover that's going to be going at some point as well. Um, so it's not just all about the atmosphere. Some people are interested in the surface as well. <laughs> um, there's no fighting allowed here, guys. Yes. <laughs> that, that's, that's fine. That's fine. If they want to look at the surface, that's all right. But, um, you know, and it's, so it's incredibly important for Europe to be involved in this, you know, as well as all the American missions that are there. It's, it's important that Europe can be involved in it as well. So, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so, John, could you tell us then, I mean, having transported this wonderful model here, mm. how is the technology changing in terms of what we're doing? I mean, th there are, you know, clearly advances in terms of what we're able to look at. Yes, the technology is certainly becoming more bolder <clears throat> and more complex. So we can now take HD images of Mars and 3D images of Mars compared to the past. But more importantly, the instruments themselves are becoming more high tech and more complex as we try and shrink down more and more of our technologies we have in our lab on Earth into fridge size experiments which we can send to other planets. Brilliant. Excellent. No, that, that's really interesting. And I think it's so useful to be able to have a, a model here that, that we can um, demonstrate. This has had quite a lot of press coverage over the last few, few weeks, hasn't it? How important is that to be able to show people something? Because it's quite a conceptually difficult um, idea to, to talk about, isn't it? Yes, it's very important to try and get the public on side of these things. Because the science is very interesting for us, but not it's very interesting science. And we have to get that a point uh, across the public so that they can realise what, why we're doing this and what, why is it significant, significant for them. Yeah, no, absolutely, <coughs> absolutely. And yeah. we're going to take um, a very short video break just after this session to fill you in on some of the, um, the aspects in terms of how everything's happened, what the launch looked like, how all of this translates into the wider the spectrum there. Um, so the whole idea then, Matt, about finding life on Mars, um, if we do find any existence of life, what are we going to do then? It kind of depends on whether we find life on Mars that is the same as on Earth, or find life on Mars that we can prove has evolved independently. Because if it's evolved independently to life on Earth, well, that basically means that there's two separate occurrences of the emergence of life next to each other in the solar system. And the chances of that happening, you know, purely coincidentally, are essentially zero. So that basically means the galaxy is teeming with life. Mm. So if we can find life in the solar system, whether it's on Mars, Europa, Enceladus, if we can find life in the solar system, that's a, a massive culture-shaking discovery. It's not just science. And you know. when we're talking about life on Mars, we're not talking, you know, uh, we're talking about the organisms, aren't we? Yeah, we're not talking about hyena or antelope galloping no, no. across the plains. We're, no, um, Martians! Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, <laughs> For Mars, we're looking at very ancient life because we, it's pretty unlikely there's life on Mars right now because we think that would probably be quite easy to see. Although, if we detect lots of methane, that, you know, that could show there's life on Mars. Um, we're looking back three, 3.7 billion years ago to when Mars was probably a, a more habitable planet. So we're looking for what we call biomarkers, little bits of geochemical or geological evidence that say there was once life. But, you know, that is the same period that time uh, that on Earth life was getting started 3.74 billion years ago. So that's, that's why we go looking at those ancient rocks on Mars as well. 
We're looking for that same origin of life. There have been some questions as well in the chat about the idea of fossils, and you're talking about ancient life and finding various things. Is it likely that we would find anything like that? Well, like I say, we're not going to find a, a, you know, a jawbone of a dinosaur or anything, but you know, the chances are that there could possibly be microfossils or other what we call morphological indicators, so indicators of the shape of something that we look at that could tell us that this is part of the evidence of life. We're never going to find anything that just says, boom, life. We're going to have to add up lots of different types of evidence and you know, weigh them all together and say, yep, we found it. Which is what I think makes this particular panel of, so interesting because you're all looking at these various different aspects and also in various different remits as well. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got obviously, you know, the equipment. Um, then you're both looking at surface modelling, you know, the environment, um, the parachute. I mean, there's so many, so many different aspects here um, that, that all translate that you're all looking at at very different levels. OK, well, um, thank you. That's been a really interesting introduction. And we're going to break down some of these areas beforehand. Um, but uh, we've been getting some of the results from the widgets. So we were asking what level you're studying at, which faculty you're with. And it's great to see so many new science students with us. Welcome to the Student Hub if you haven't come before. Um, I hope you're figuring it all out. Um, there are a couple of things that you might like to know about if you haven't been before. So the chat, you can ask any questions in the chat. You can put your thoughts, your observations and comments. You can also change the layout of the interface. So those of you who are just joining us um, and haven't seen that interface video that we played before the show, you can change the options so that you can increase the size of the chat or the widgets, etc. And if you haven't voted on the widgets, you can do so just by clicking on them, put your data in there and then uh, close them down and then your data will populate and you'll be able to see what other people have added also. With the word clouds where we have three things, so we might say what three words describe something. Um, if you can't think of three, just put a couple and put an X, but they won't send or populate until you've completed the actual graphs. Um, so, so that's all really, really good. Um, if you have any questions, do let um, Sophie and HJ know. Are there any immediate things, HJ and Sophie, that we need to bring to people's attention? Um, Not it... really, I don't think. We've, we've, we started the lunch conversations early, good. so... Uh... <laughs> Mm. That always um, comes in place. And what's the weather like round, outside? Because we're obviously in a studio here in Milton Keynes where I think it was partly cloudy beforehand. But how's the weather doing with everybody? Looks the similar for most people, actually, partly cloudy. A um, little bit of sun somewhere. I don't know where that is. I'm very jealous very wherever few the sun lucky is. <laughs> But 76% of people at the moment are partly cloudy, I'm afraid. I think uh, David did uh, ask a question. We may come on to it later. But uh, he says, uh, has the EDM been in contact since uh, shoot deployment? And yes, that's his question. Okay. So he's very interested and eager, I think, David. But we shall find out over now or as we yes, go. Shall <laughs> so we tackle that one a little bit later? Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. We'll find out uh, what the weather's like on Mars uh, just a little bit later. But first, we're going to play you a very short video from the European Space Agency, um, which just shows you exactly how it all happened. And we'll see you in about three minutes, where I'll be joined by John. And we're going to take a look at the Trace Gas Orbiter in a lot more detail. We'll see you very soon.